Good evening and welcome everybody to Palmetto Cats Live. I hope everyone has had an awesome day. Thank you all for waiting an extra 30 minutes so we can accommodate a fantastic guest tonight. Tonight we have Captain Brad Durick. Uh, Brad Durick Outdoors on YouTube channel. And he also has a catfish guide service uh, that we'll talk about. The Brad Durick Outdoors LLC Red River of the North guide service. Links can be found to his channel and the website in the description. So after the show, if you want to learn more about Brad that we didn't cover, you can go check it out in the description, but thank you for everybody coming in. I'm looking at you over there. I appreciate you. I do want to shout out some people right off the bat. Uh, my long-term supporters, my monetary supporters, the boom squad. Thank you. Had a little tribute for you right there in the beginning. If you want to join the boom squad, there's a link in the description. Uh, or you can just hit that join button right there on the side. Uh, the Golden Whisker sponsorships are now gone. All the sponsorships are gone, but you can still be a show sponsor. If you want to get your channel or your business advertised, you just need to email me at palmettocats at gmail.com, and uh, I'll get in touch with you, and we'll talk about what your needs are and and uh, see if you can help with the the sponsorships, uh, you know, the sponsorships are just a small part of what it takes to put on the show. So anything else uh, just helps out with shipping and and uh, show costs. So anyway, that being said, we're going to get to things here in just a second. I got one more thing I want to share and I'll share it at the end as well. I uh, just want to say I'm hosting the uh, River Wars tournament right here on Palmetto Cats this Saturday, November 19th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time. The Mighty James River is taking on the Tennessee River. It's going to be a whole lot of action. Hopefully the fishing is, has gotten better than last weekend uh, for those parts uh, uh, of the country. Two well-known rivers. It, anything could happen. Some big fish could go on. But uh, it's my honor to host that for Brian B. Catfishing. Uh, so come check that out. Make sure you share that out. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to bring up our guest, Captain Brad Dirk. How are you doing tonight, sir? Good. Thanks for waiting for me. Yeah, no problem, man. Uh, you know, we we had another guest, and I w I've been wanting to have you on for a long time. We've been texting back and forth, but we had to wait on your guide schedule uh, to get finished up. Um, and uh, I've been anticipating it, and I wanted to have you on, but the guest we had on for tonight canceled, so Brad bailed me out, and uh, we get to not only bail not only to bail me out, but he's adding to my content because uh, Brad is a wealth of knowledge. When it comes to catfishing and especially the channel cat world, so uh, Brad, I thank you for coming on. Uh, tell me, tell me about the Red River of the North. Is there is there a Red River of the South? I'm, I'm there, guessing there is a Red River of the South. It's actually Texas and Louisiana. They are not mm. connected at all. They not have nothing connected. to do with each other. Um, our okay. river is one of two major watersheds in the world that run north. Mm. So it starts down along the North Dakota, Minnesota border where the Otter Tail River and the Boy Sioux River, which are two teeny weeny little rivers, meet. Right. And then as it works its way north, it goes through us and then ultimately into Canada mm. and around through Hudson Bay and into the Atlantic Ocean is ultimately where it ends up. Nice. Yeah. So you are uh, certified, Coast Guard certified in, in Minnesota and North Dakota. Is that correct? Well, Coast Guard and then Minnesota does not require oh, okay. a outfitter license, and North Dakota does. So gotcha. I have what I have to have. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think we have to have a Coast Guard license as well here in South Carolina. So it's a lot of work to, to get that, doesn't it? It costs you a good bit of money to get that cranked up? Well, I'm in the middle of renewal right now, so I'm being reminded quickly. <laughs> 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 Jason Ward said the Red River is the best channel cat fishery in uh NA, the truth. What is NA? Is that is that is that North Dakota? Uh must have missed the letter. Yeah, I okay. don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, Jason Ward uh is a good friend and uh if he says it if he says it's true it's true but you that's that's gonna be a question later but we can go ahead and get it if you want to get the biggest channel cats in, in the united states where do you go well i mean of course i'm gonna say red river first north america is what he meant okay 
Oh, North America. Yeah. Red River first. Um, you may not get the biggest channel cat here. I mean, uh, Madison, Wisconsin's got big channel cats. There's a place uh, up north in New York's got big channel cats. They say Colorado has some big channel cats. So I can't say the biggest, but what I can say is probably the most big ones. Ah, okay. So you have uh, the quantity over the, the size of them. So, I mean, yeah, you, uh, we're always shooting for 20 pounders. Of course, you're going to hear of a 30 here and there mm -hmm. or whatever. But, uh, you know, if, if things are rocking, it's nothing to get 20. I mean, I've had days where I've had 50 to 60 over 15 in a day. Wow. That's exceptional. That is not mm -hmm. the normal. That is exceptional. <laughs> now, see, it, it's such a different thing for me. Um, you know, down here, Channel Cat. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a trash fish, but it's like it's a nuisance down here because we don't get those big ones down here. Uh, you know, the, the blue cat population is kind of taken over. Uh, you know, we do have the world record channel cat on Lake Moultrie. But, uh, but you know, since they introduced blues, they, they out eat them. They've, and I've never caught a channel cat over 10 pounds. And see, we don't have blues or flatheads, so... Our channel cats are the apex predator. The they win all the real world. estate battles. They eat what they want to eat, and they swim where they want to swim. Mm. Uh, Plus, no, the locals don't tend to keep them up here, so most of them are going back into the water, and we have very, very strict regulations on them. Mm. So tell us a little bit about that. Like, what are the record or the, the restrictions? Or um, on the U.S. side of the Red River, it's five fish for uh, daily limit and possession, and only one of those five can be over 24 inches, which is about four and a half, five pounds. On the Canadian side, it's zero over 24 inches. So we have pretty tight regulations on it up here. So this is kind of how Larry is from my area. He says freezer fillers for me. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, if you catch blues all day you know if if you're into conservation you release those but channel cats always are going to bucket you know it's like <laughs> we're gonna eat those channel cats yeah um, you know i live in walleye world so mm -hmm. if you want to eat a fish you go get one of them i got you see i've never tasted a walleye it's white um, meat and it doesn't taste like much am i is, am i missing anything special i don't know everybody kind of goes gaga over it up here and I'm not a big fish eater to begin with, but gotcha. I mean, they're, they're a firm fish. That's fairly tasteless. You put a little breading on them and fry them. They're very, very good. Okay. And uh, you know, they're the king up here. So that's what everybody's after. I kind of feel that way about most freshwater fish. It's like, you know, if you closed your eyes and you took all the bones out and kind of chopped it up and gave it to me without anything on it, it would kind of taste the, the same. But, uh, you know, I, I don't really I don't really know of many times where I cook a fish where I don't put anything on it. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, our fish salt and pepper or something like that. Back to your question. Our fish mm -hmm. have the best of uh, the best of everything for the most part. Lots of food, not a lot of predators. You know, people just don't keep them much around here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's always they're, they're just they're well taken care of. So do you think um, or do you know if they, they don't keep them because they want to conserve them or they just they don't they don't eat them? They don't care to eat them. Yes, both. Both. OK. Um, I've been noticing more and more guiding that people are taking a few more home to try them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I it, it's not many over the course of a year by by any stretch, but I've mm -hmm. noticed a few more. I'd say this last season. Normally, we have, in a season, 50 to 60 fish go home with people. It was probably closer to 100 this last year. So, I mean, it's not like we're tearing it apart or anything. But, mm -hmm. you know, I did. I have noticed there's more and more going home. So when you do uh, guide services, do you have, like, a certain rule on your boat, like a certain size goes back, or you just follow the, the law? Nope. I went with the none over 24 rule. Okay. So... You're allowed one. I say none. 
I'm not in the business of filling freezers. I'm in the business of, of getting a picture of a big fish. Yeah. So yeah. I want the, I want all the big ones back. I've always done it back when we had some other guides around, they all did it as well. So, okay. Um, nothing big is going home with people. That's not a huge sentiment around here. Um, now there are some, a few guides, uh, on Moultrie that I know of, um, that do, you know, have the kind of rule like, Hey, this, this size catfish is going back in the water. But a lot of people make the trek down here to Santee Cooper to do that freezer filling activity. Um, so that's that's a refreshing statement to hear from you that, you know, not a lot of the guides around there practice the same policy. Yeah, I mean, I'm the only one left on the U.S. stretch. Really? Um, health reasons, family reasons, for whatever reason, Coast Guard isn't exactly an easy thing to get, so... No. You know, there used to be five of us, and and now you're looking at me. <laughs> I mean, good for you, I guess. <laughs> more business. <laughs> it's uh, more business, but, you know, a little competition keeps you sharp, too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. So you wrote two books, one of them yep. called Cracking the Catfish Code and one called Advanced Catfishing Made Easy. Um, now, I know one of them you talk about an interesting topic called lateral movement. So kind of hold off on that. But okay. can you tell me a little bit about those two books and, and what people can look forward to? By the way, you can get these books on Brad's website. And the links is in the description. They actually put them on Amazon. All right, Amazon. <laughs> go, go to Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> it's quicker and easier, and I don't think I have any catfish codes on hand. Got you, got you, got you. But so tell, uh, tell us a little bit about these books. So catfish code all started when I, cause when I started guiding, I thought I knew how to fish and it took me about two years to realize that uh, I really didn't. And, you know, when you're taking money from people, you have to deliver, you know, that is an aspect that says you're going to stay in business or you're not going to stay in business. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2010 in particular, we had water going up and water going down and, you know, the spots just weren't jiving a lot of the times mm -hmm. or you would just kill them one day and then it'd be a week and you wouldn't. And I started asking some questions and going to Google and, you know, just trying to find anything I could to catch more fish or stay more consistent, I guess would probably be the mm -hmm. better way to put it. And I ended up, uh, finding Doug Stangy at In Fisherman's email address. And I said, you wrote the book on this. You know, what am I supposed to do here? And his response was, well, we never really dug that deep. <laughs> okay. So I started record keeping and I had kept records for the previous three or four years <clears throat> just on a calendar. So I was able to go through and start charting when the water goes up, the fish tend to do this. When the water goes down, the fish tend to do this. And it took a couple more years of goofing off and a couple more aha moments right. on the water to start putting it together. And actually, they're always going to do the same thing no matter where they are in the, in the you know, everything. So I found myself with different topics, <clears throat> which would have been a series of pretty nice articles. And then I was talking to a couple of people and it ultimately came to how do you make a buck on this? Because this is original research. Right. And that's where catfish code came. Advanced catfishing came because I didn't have a winter job one year. So I sat down and I took kind of the method that I use in my head based on catfish code. And I made it into a pick your own adventure book. So if you haven't read it, basically how it's laid out is I got a hold of in fishermen and I got permission to use their seasonal chart for the United States Okay. of the North to the South when their typical spawn time is things like that. And then I went through what I wrote in catfish code and just said in the spring, possibly this to this, this water temperature range. If your water's rising, do this. If your water's falling, do this. If you're, temperatures rising and your water's falling do this and i kind of you just kind of flip to the page you want and it's a couple of patterning paragraphs hmm. to get going so it's very short and easy and if you just sat and read it it probably doesn't make a lot of sense
But if you kind of start to understand the concepts of it, you just use it as a quick reference. You just flip it open to the time of year, check your temperatures, check your water levels. And oh. you know, all that information is available online for today. Really? Yeah. You, and well, don't tell everybody so they'll buy your book. <laughs> well, no, what I mean is you can look on your, basically any river in the United States and it'll tell you what the water's doing in temperature, in levels, in flows. Some of them do turbidities. So you can get that information in real time. I see what you're saying. And then you can go over. I use wunderground.com. You can get the same on your weather trending, your winds, your barometers, your things like that. So then you match that together in real time, look back a couple of days to how it's been trending, and then you say the fish should be here. Gotcha. <laughs> Then it's up to you to just learn your your body of water and how to make the proper adjustments within those tips. I've seen that kind of technology in some of today's fish finders. Now I don't have one, but I think Hummingbird uh, Hummingbird has an option to where you can plug in variables like that, um, and it'll smart strike. It'll, it'll take your uh, what's that? It's called Smart Strike. Smart Strike. Okay. Like I said, I didn't have I didn't I don't have one, but I know a couple of my friends do. And uh, they they put it on their map, on their on their GPS, on their on their screen, and then they say, "Yeah, I'm fishing," uh, or the wind is doing this, the water's doing this, water, and then they look at your map and they tell you areas that the fish should be in. Mm -hmm. And you know, once you get to talking about lateral movement, I'll dig a little deeper. Yeah, let's talk about what is lateral movement. So what I figured out when I was doing the research, and if you've heard me speak in the past couple of years, I don't talk much about lateral movement anymore. For whatever reason, that never clicked with people. I think it is viewed as too big. Okay. So what I talk about now is on current versus off current. It's ex I mean exactly the same thing. So what I found is, so you have a spot where it's got, say, a nice big bend, traditional catfish water. You've got deep water, you've got shallow water, you've got cover with it within a snag, you've got a fast edge and a slow edge, mm -hmm. all within, you know, some something for everybody, so to speak. What lateral movement is, is basically you do what I just said, figuring out what the trends are and how the fish react to those trends. And it could be as simple as casting from the to the left side of the boat or the right side of the boat within that same area. For example, say you have 72 degree water, you've had stable weather for days and days and days, and the barometer's dropping just a touch and there's going to be a storm in a couple of days. Or it's trending like there's going to be a storm in the next couple of days. The fish are going to be feeding aggressively, feeling good. So they'll be in the either the head of the hole, the faster water, or the outside bend. That storm, that's on current. That's okay. lateral movement to on current. That storm hits, that barometer drops out. Now that fish isn't going to feed necessarily. Well, he's not going to travel two or three miles up or down river. He's going to move out of that current get a little more sluggish, find that cover, and maybe not be as aggressive to feed. It's So it's just a matter of moving it over a little, maybe extending your sit times, maybe making your baits a little bit smaller, uh, things like that. Um, you know, I lived on it this fall. I was fishing all the same stuff this fall when the water was cooling, only I was on the inside of the bend instead of the outside of the bend, fishing the exact same holes. Instead of a 15 or 20 minute, anchor sit i was sitting 25 to about 35 minutes catching the same fish in the same hole just adjusting a touch to the weather now i imagine you could apply these principles to blue catfish as well am, am I, I i absolutely believe you can and i just don't have the experience to do it but i'm sure with a little bit of record keeping and a little bit of knowledge of blue cats it would not be very hard and, and so the only reason I asked that, I mean, I, I figured you could apply it to I mean, it sounds like a lot of the same stuff that uh, a couple other people talk about for blue cats. But I, I, I'm wondering, 
I'm I'd like to apply that to a tidal river um, where you have water shifting every six hours, um, you know, adding that extra variable. In. And, and you said one one thing that always confused me and I never realized why people said it until, you know, I, I came to the conclusion, oh, it's because I'm fishing a tidal river. But people talk about the insides and outsides of bins. Well, my insides and outsides of bins switch. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I have to I have to figure out like, okay, you know, because we switch water, are the same conditions going to be the same? Are, are the same principles going to be the same for that once outside bin? Now that it's an inside bin, do the fish move from that bend to the other side or vice versa? What do you what do you, do you what do you think about that? I know well, you have I, have, experience, I haven't the foggiest idea because I've never actually experienced it. Mm -hmm. That being said, wouldn't an outside bend remain an outside bend even if the water's going backwards? It just depends on which way you're traveling, I guess, which way you're fishing. Well, it doesn't matter how you're fishing, it matters how the water's moving. Mm. I guess you're right. I guess you're right. It just always seemed like, you know, what what do you call an outside bend i guess if you have like a peninsula on one side and then you have a cut on the other i guess you would call it i got my whiteboard here i wonder if i got a marker stuck to it hey find one man because i got the ability to make you big <laughs> i don't have a marker i would have drawn oh, it out what i mean <laughs> uh, yeah so i i've always I've, I've always wondered if i could apply the same principles that we hear so um so this time of year, I know that you don't, you, you know, you kind of stop guiding. Do you ever travel south to fish uh, or do you ice fish for channel cast? Do you do anything like that? Ice fishing has not been a thing for me. I know they do it not very far from here in some lakes. Mm. They don't get the monsters. I'm not a big fan of being in a river that has changing currents and 10 foot cut banks on both sides trying to travel. Mm. So I'm just going to say I kind of shut her down and forget about it for the winter. We do ice fish. We ice fish for other things. Other things, yeah. What's yeah, the big uh, What's the big winter uh, fish that you chase if you go ice fishing? Where we live, it's walleyes, pike, and perch. The big yellow perch with the red fin? Yep, yep. yellow perch. Mm. I heard those um, were really good eating, So too. that's king here. A couple hours away, we got pan fish. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, you know, hopefully here in a couple of weeks, we'll be able to do some pan fishing through the ice because that's one of my favorite things. And it's just not very close. But I always say I'm going to go south. I've been south a couple of times. And then the last couple of years traveling hasn't exactly been easy. Um, we've had some unfortunate water conditions that cost me quite a bit of money. So I haven't been a big traveler because of that either. Got you. Um, let's see. Uncle Lou Lee Reed said, um, Devil's Lake. Do you know where that's at? Yeah, it's an hour and a half west of me, and I have a house on it. So spend a lot of time over there. <laughs> <laughs> now you said you're not very familiar with lake fishing. Um, but I mean, do you do you ever do you ever venture out on the lake every once in a while? Or there well, you, when I say lake that? fishing, I mean for catfish. Oh, I got um, you. I'm very in tune to lake fishing, just not for catfish, because there's no mm -hmm catfish over in that lake but i got you I, got um, you. I thought it was funny i helped out with a tournament down in in lee's area a few years ago and those guys understand it because they're more in walleye world but when i was at catfish conference people were like planer boards are this big new revolutionary thing it's like they've been in walleyes for 30 years it's not new for us right you just get bigger ones with bigger rods and drive slower is basically it mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I, I apparently it's been a thing down here for a while. I just I'm new to the catfishing world, like this, like getting really into the trophy catfish world. I guess you can say, uh, three years in, so my learning has been accelerated. Um, I'm I'm on the honors path, the AP <laughs> courses to try to catch up to everybody. But you're relatively new to the catfishing world too. What did you do before? Well, I mean. I'm just, I was new to fishing. I mean, I've already been guiding for 15 years and been mm -hmm. around catfishing for over 20, but um, I was still late in life 
figuring all this out. And it just mostly was because we lived on a farm and nobody did it. Mm -hmm. We had one little lake about 10 miles from our house and that was it. My dad was a farmer. He farmed. That's what he did. That's what we did. So it just wasn't a thing until I got to college. And I think a lot of it after college got to be just the being outside because I wasn't at the farm. I had an office job at the time. So, mm. you know, you got to get your outside time in. And uh, so I've, you know, I went in with both feet to just fishing in general for multi-species. And then when I learned about catfishing, well, then it was pretty much all over from there. <laughs> but uh, so I'm just glad I didn't know about this river when I was going to college. Why do you think, why, why do you say that? Because I never would have been in school. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have been a river rat for, for life, huh? I would have literally been living in the van by the river instead of just <laughs> living in in the river. Yeah. But uh, no, it's, uh, you know, I learned how to, I really, really got serious in catfishing in 2001. Hmm. And about 2007, it was, you know, one of the guides in town is maybe you should start thinking about doing this. So I went and got the Coast Guard license. And like I said, I thought I knew how to fish, but yeah. I was wrong. <laughs> I thought I knew how to catfish too. Um, and then I started chasing trophy cats. And I remember, um, not that I was cocky or anything, but I felt confident. You know, I, I my dad and I joined up a tournament right down here at Santee Cooper. And it was just, you know, a local club tournament. And we were both like, yeah, we've caught, we've caught big cats before, you know, Hey, we're going to do this. It's easy. I think we caught three blue cats all day and our total weight was 16 pounds. And so we went back to the way and we're thinking, yeah, everybody must've had a bad day if we didn't catch them. Boy, they were pulling up forties and fifties and sixties left and right. And we just kind of tucked our tail and it's like, yeah, maybe maybe we don't know as much as we know. <laughs> think we know. It's it a sounds like experience. my first tournament. Tell me about it. My first tournament, I got talked into it by the guy who introduced me to catfishing, and I was only a year or so in. And oh yeah, enter this tournament. It'll be fun. You'll learn a lot. It'll be great. Yeah, we learned a lot. We learned a lot that we took an ass whooping of epic proportions is what we learned. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Lou said Brad's son will be a very good fisherman also. Oh, yeah. He's coming around. Uh, Fishing Big Mike said trophy cat will make you beat your head on a tree. Sometimes, sometimes. Hey, the first page in Cracking the Channel Catfish Code says, just when you think you have these fish pr figured out, they'll prove you stupid. Mm -hmm. That's page one. <laughs> I like what you said, too. You had a couple aha moments, and my goal for 2022 was to learn my river better for catfishing. Uh, you know, I grew up pan fishing. You know, you tell me to go catch some shell crackers or some brim, I'm going to go bring, you know, how many, boss? You know, like, <laughs> I'm going to go find them and, and tear them up. But when catfishing, you know, actually chasing them and targeting them and not just lucking into them, uh, I've learned so much this year just by being intentional about trying new spots and even this past saturday uh me and a uh, um, catfish bill he's another youtuber we went out uh farther down the river tried some i anchored in current that i i don't even i don't know how fast it was five miles per hour six miles per hour. i mean it was we couldn't spot lock we had to use the anchor and uh it kept pulling us off pulling us off until it finally stuck uh, we had to use 10 ounce weights to keep the bait, the bait down. And I'm thinking there's no way, but we were on a, uh, an inside bend. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, this, I mean, there's current seams. We have, you know, current and then there's structure and there's depth changes and uh, a channel wall. I said, we cut, we know, fishing with four rods. We spread them out. I said, we got to catch something, right? Thinking we're not going to catch anything. We had three double ups. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, just taking them down. Now, nothing over 10 pounds, but, I mean, it just, it was an aha moment. It's like, wow, you know, now I'm, I, I can't wait to get back out on that river and try another spot that looks good just because of that. So, how, how much experience did you have with that? Just like, uh, especially guiding, um, you know, 
do you go to like honey holes or do you go with your science and and that that's oh totally i've cool. got my i got my like list don't get me wrong i i got my like list but one of you know guiding teaches you a lot now going back to what you saw i don't know if you're keeping records of your trips oh, i keep a record. calendar of every trip <laughs> I've, I've taken since 2007 and I've learned so much of that. And what I notate is if we had a really good day, I notate what were, was really good about it. Mm. And if we had a disaster, I notate what was wrong or what I thought was wrong. And that's been really cool because it can be two or even three years later, we'll be having that same disaster. And I'll remember that disaster and go, okay, it was really bad last time. We did this and it didn't work. So mm -hmm. then you'd kind of do what you were saying. You just did. And if it works, that's great. Then you kind of go back to the book and compare it. And if you get that a couple of times, now you've got a trend. And now, mm -hmm. oh, I've seen this before. We're not doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a lot of it. But no. You know, keeping good records and keeping ob observing, just pay attention to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. What's working? What isn't working? What's the day bringing? I mean, I think I am good at that. Now, I don't keep like physical written down records, but, you know, as a YouTuber, I, I document everything. So, you know, I, I got one of my books right here, actually. I just clean in this room today. I'm finding all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Let's see. This is a catch record from 2012. So basically, I don't know if you can see that. That's mm -hmm. basically what I keep on a daily basis. It's just a quick little note. Okay. And uh, all I've got is uh, where I was fishing, how many hours we fish, how many fish we landed, the biggest fish, and uh, who I was with. And then I can go online and I can get the water stats later and put all that in if I need it. Mm -hmm. So I'll start trending, you know, what kind of spots worked good, what kind of spots didn't, how did we make adjustments and, and things like that. And mm -hmm. it was funny. I, I used to use side imaging a ton I, and I still think it's a wonderful tool, but ever since Humminbird came out with auto chart live and I took the time and built maps of the river, all I, once I get it patterned, it's all following GPS, GPS and maps. Everything's color coded on that map. Once you find the color and what current seam you want, just go for it. Wow. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything too fancy. I just I have a Garmin uh, 93G X1000. So, I don't know. Some <laughs> uh, 93 UHD, I think. Um, I mean, it's it's a great unit. It's a great unit, but I don't think it does anything like that. But uh, but that's awesome, man. That you can you've taken that time to categorize, and, and I guess you have to if you if you want to be a successful guide, you got to be able to provide. Well, I just wanted a map because there was no map. Of course, you always have your coordinates. I keep your my coordinates, and I was always pretty good at figuring out holes. I mean, going back to when I started learning to catfish, we were using a Vexilar flasher in a fourteen foot boat. It would mm -hmm. take you an entire summer to figure out a corner of the river to know where the drop-offs were, where all the, you know, kind of everything was on the bottom of it. Then I got to an L LCD graph where it would actually kind of draw you a picture and you'd figure out the subtleties of it over the course of a little while. Well, then side imaging, oh my God, you take a picture of it in two minutes and take a look. But then when you can match that to a map, you know everything about it with that map, with that side image. I mean, you can do 100 yards of river literally in two minutes. So you don't use... Um... You don't use uh, Navionics for your map? You just build your own? Well, no, there's no map that exists for our river. Oh, it's not a nav navigable water? Is that what it, Well, it? it is, and there's supposed to be a map according to the Coast Guard, but there's no there's no such thing. So when the Humminbird put the auto chart live ability to make your own maps, it was never meant for what I'm doing with it. It was meant to be that point where you like to fish your panfish to give it a buzz over and then use it as an overlay to the map you already have. So it's the spot on the spot, so to speak. Mm. It was never meant to do five pass maps of 45 to 50 miles of river. 
and you know map it like that but then i've learned how to set my ranges and color code everything with that so you have your experience spots that work you so know, hold on a second I, I got some questions about color code. i must have misunderstood what exactly are you color coding because i can color deeper code water yeah. in my case the deeper water is darker blue okay the, so yeah i can't shallow really unit. okay bank stuff is like orange got you yeah so, no i do the same thing i thought you said something about color coding where current seams are Oh, no, no. I just kind of know where they are and I learn them. I got you. I got you. So then as I, you know, experience, you get that coordinate in there. So if you get, say, they're off current in the slower side of the of the current seam mm -hmm. and they're in light blue, well, that's pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> just go to the off current in the light blue holes. And, you know, it, it's it's made my life a whole lot easier. Oh, and, what, you know, once you're out there every day. You don't need to image and look for fish. You just get your clock going and rock it. Yeah, yeah. I imagine that is a huge difference, too, when you're out there every day as opposed to me. I'm the weekend warrior one day, you know. Now, next week, it's on like Donkey Kong because I got Thanksgiving break. So y'all be looking out for some live streams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be out there as many days as I can physically handle it. Um so here's another here's another thing that uh, me and a couple of my a couple of my friends talk about um, marking fish and fishing for fish that you mark or going to what you're talking about places where fish should be and fishing there. What what do you do? I mean, do you do more one or the other or a combination? I almost never take the time to mark a fish. Okay. I almost never do. Now, if I go through my day and they were here yesterday and they're not here today, mm. then I'm kind of calculating what changed, why are the fish not here, and you make a couple of adjustments. And if that's not working, then I'll go looking for them. And sometimes, for whatever reason, I'll be fishing the head to the middle of the hole and they'll move to the back of the hole. And it's just a matter of moving 10, 20 yards back mm. from where I normally like. But traditionally, active fish are at the front or middle of the hole. Slug it, more sluggish fish will tend to go to the back of the hole and sulk. So but are you I, only looking for holes then? Not necessarily, but I'm looking. I follow current number one and holes number two. Okay. Um, the biggest, baddest holes I tend to avoid because everybody else fishes them. Fair point. I like the subtle little stuff, the stuff that's two and three feet deeper than everything that's around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find, you know, pre pre map, if you had some of those in your repertoire, nobody ever found them. Mm -hmm. Now that everybody's got the ability to map, if they're doing it and paying attention, they're not as, as uh, easy to hide as they used to be, mm -hmm. so to speak. But I like the little subtle stuff that a lot of people struggle to find because I kind of get it to myself. Right. That being said, you can't go back day after day after day in those little holes. You have to rest them. Yeah. So you have to have a lot more of them to make it work. Just come to South Carolina and fish my river, man. I think um, unless there's a tournament, I think I'm the only guy that fishes it for catfish. <laughs> you can have all the holes to yourself. <laughs> Well, it used to be like that here too, where you get the whole place to yourself and mm -hmm. not like that anymore. Now, the only thing you have to outrun here is pleasure boaters, but not so much right now. Bass fish, our, our river is a huge bass river. Like people come from all over to fish the Cooper for bass. But, uh, you know, there's some big catfish in there too. So, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the catfish guys, well, most of them, they, they're up in the lakes, you know, the famous mm -hmm. Anthony Cooper lakes. So I, I wanted to learn the river this year, so I stayed in the river. That's where I grew up anyway, um, and I'm really, really enjoying it. I'm supposed to – my goal for 2023 is supposed to be to learn Lake Moultrie better, um, to fish places I never fished before, take more chances, go outside the box, and all that stuff. But uh, I'm really liking the river. I don't want to leave it. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, in my, in my view, a, a river is a river and a fish is a fish. If you master your river – Mm -hmm. I think that puts you way ahead wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I wouldn't say I've mastered it, but I see what you're saying. Like 
you know, I, I just get so excited now. I enjoy fishing. Uh, you know, once I got into YouTube, I, I focused so much on the video and the content. And now I'm more excited about trying a new spot. Like I'll see something. I'm like, Ooh, you know, I put a pin there. So I'm going to try that next time. I'll try it next time. Where before I'm like, I don't know if there's a fish there. I'm going to go to old faithful and see if I can pull one out. So uh, I'm enjoying it a lot more. And, you know, even if I don't catch a fish in a hole or in a, on a, you know, I look for the structure and, and in holes too. Um, but, uh, you know, if I don't catch anything, then I'll just move to the next one where before I would get frustrated and probably give up. So, well, uh, one thing I've found is if, if you fail on something, pay attention to it because you never know when it might spin back around or yeah. you might have made some just subtle little mistake. And if you can find that aha moment, yeah. you know, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made guiding is we were late fall wrapping it up. We had a big front pushing and I started to panic and I started moving faster. So, I mean, mm -hmm. if I was in a spot 10 minutes and didn't get a bite, I was out. Mm -hmm. Well, over time, I learned that when that situation's happening, get out of the current and set your clock to a half an hour and let the fish come to you mm -hmm. and slow it down so they can actually find the bait. I stewed in that mistake for a whole winter really? before I figured out what was going on. And, and that's saved me a lot mm. by, you know, just by managing that failure, so to speak. Yeah, I, I learned that pretty quickly. Well, I learned the opposite way. I'd go sit in a spot for hours. Um, because that's, you know, starting out catfishing, that's what people think you do. You go out, you throw your bait out and you kick back and wait for something to come along. Um, but I started limiting my spots, especially when I figured out spot lock, um, limiting to 30 minutes. So I had the opposite problem. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't pick up and move. Well, I'm a clock watcher. So I always set a baseline at the beginning of the day to 20 minutes. Yeah. And then kind of feel them out. And some days, some days it's a half hour. Some days it's more mm. or less. I mean, I've had it down. I've had it dialed down to if you don't have a fish in 10 minutes, get out. Mm. Or if you catch two fish, get out. I mean, I, I've I, experienced some of that too. Unless uh, unless I'm in a tournament, um, I'll usually, as long as I'm catching fish, I'll stay. Um, and this is how, this is my YouTube mind, you know. If I catch X amount of fish, I can make a video, right? So I focus on, after I get the fish, I focus more on the, the technique and what I'm doing and, and all the B-roll and stuff. But now once I have those fish, if they're all small, I then start finding finding out places where I can catch bigger fish. Um, and that actually worked for me on the last video I dropped. I moved to a different spot. Um, I was catching lots of small ones, so I moved out. Like you said, I moved, shifted over in the current, and I, I hit one about 40 pounds, and it was it was awesome. I was like, man, this is the first time. Like, that's why I say I'm so excited because it's the first time I'm actually, you know, putting these things that I've learned from you and other people in the community to, to practice and not worrying about the content as much. And the content – benefits from it because i'm catching better fish so so anyway um let's talk about uh ugly sticks okay. you know, a lot of people myself included uh and still love them i still have some grew up fishing ugly sticks um you know when when i was young and even up until before i started catfishing seriously i thought that was the only thing on the market and the best thing on the market. And some people say it is the best thing on the market. I'm sure you would say it is. But uh, but then after these rod companies, you know, got people got invested in catfishing, and I think it's great. And there's more rods coming out. You get whatever color you want now, different variables. You can even design your own rod. Um, you know, the ugly stick name has kind of like shifted to the to the back door for a lot of people. But then, you know, you'll get in these chats or come in these shows and people say, oh, I, that's all I use is ugly stick. So kind of tell us about your affiliation and and uh, why you believe in them so much. Well, I, you know, like most people starting out, think finding things were 
hard for catfishing. I mean, yeah. I've watched this whole thing. You know, I'm relatively new to it, like we talked earlier, but I've watched this whole thing evolve from basically where you're getting ugly sticks or what was the other one out in those days? We used a lot of ugly sticks. Um, you had that big cat Patterson rod, the Berkeley, the original Berkeley, Berkeley E-Cat. Yeah. That Berkeley was already E-Cat. on its downswing at that point. But to find a catfish rod, especially for circle hook with a softer tip, was next to impossible. Mm-hmm. But ugly sticks worked, and I I liked, for our fish, I liked the ugly stick striper, actually, back then. Okay. Of course, life goes on, and, you know, people start uh, putting out more catfish-specific stuff. So, I mean, I've got racks and racks and racks of rods. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was sponsored by a different rod company at one point, great mm-hmm. rod company, and due to a business decision, I ended up a a free agent again. Gotcha. And um, I was hired by a free agent. (laughs) Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, when that other company was sold, my contract was sold with it. So I've been traded too. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. Keep going. (laughs) Anyway. Hey, it's close to professional sports. Yeah. Hey, why not, man? Why not? (laughs) Anyways, uh, I got hired. Well, actually, I was still with the other company, and I got hired by a couple of pure fishing reps that were passing through town. Mm-hmm. And they were asking me about ugly sticks and various things. And anyways, uh, that other deal fell apart, and I was still in contact with those guys. And they're like, well, why don't you uh, why don't you do this? You know, that's a pretty smart idea. So, I mean, they're inexpensive. You can go to Walmart and buy them. Mm-hmm. And... They're indestructible for what I'm doing. I mean, I don't think I would necessarily want to catch a 100-pound blue on the ones I'm using. But I've got them dialed the down The world now. record is on an ugly stick catfish rod. World record blue cat. Well, there you have it. <laughs> I, I was my first time sturgeon fishing up on northern Minnesota. I saw a 70-pound sturgeon brought in on a on an on a black ugly the original black ugly stick mm. and i tell you what that thing did not break i, I thought it was going to blow up in his hands but it, it didn't so but anyways that's the story uh it was a good idea i bought them cheap i started guiding with them and they've been really good for me and just over time i've gotten in with you know the ugly stick company i've got to try some different things and that's huge man and uh you know they got the catfish specials out now Next spring, they've got the catfish carbons coming out. Don't tell me that. Duh. Yeah, it's going to be good. For guys who like to bump, I think they're going to like it. <laughs> well, there you go, people. Now you have yet another rod. To, Seven to and a half at. carbon catfish. That's it interesting. Was, tell I tested it that. last year. It was at ICAST. This year, it should be out in the spring. What what is that? You said seven foot, seven and a half, seven and a half foot. So basically, like your standard catfish rod that we see nowadays. But uh, so you said it's carbon. It does it have like the the little space in between the the handle and stuff, so you can feel the the rod, the blank. Uh, it does, it's not a split grip. Not a split grip. But it's uh, the thing weighs nothing. When I took it out of the box, I was like, "You kidding me, right?" Because the last time I felt a rod like that, I blew it up in my hands. Yeah, I'm using graphite rods right now from Anvil, and there's I have them with a PC fun reel on it, and you, it's just so freaking light. Like that's what I love about them. You're you're not picking, you're not holding anything hardly. But then so, I can imagine an ugly stick carbon rod because ugly sticks are light to begin with. Yep, but we beat the hell out of it last year, and uh, it passed every test I put it through. Uh, fish up to about 25 pounds, heavy currents, five ounce, six ounce sinkers. And uh, so it did what I asked it to do. Marie and said, you let the cat out of the bag. I didn't. It was at ICAST. It's free game now. <laughs> no, to us, to us, it's, uh, you know, because, you know, I don't know anybody that's gone to ICAST except for you now. Um, I wasn't there this year, but I knew it was there. And then uh, 
I got mine. Mine was rigged up this year when I was playing with it. I put that new uh, low profile Abu Garcia Max 60 on it. Mm -hmm. And that's a nice pairing setup. It really, uh, it really balanced nicely. Mm -hmm. Um, For guiding, the carbon is not for me. Yeah. Um, I've actually gone from the eight foot catfish special down to the seven foot catfish. You told special. me that. You told me that that you got a new shipment in last time I saw you or talked to you. Yep, I wanted eights and they were out of stock like everything else, and mm-hmm. I ended up getting sevens for the year. And after playing with the sevens, and I actually kept them even after my eights arrived. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to stick to the seven because they're light enough to sense and hook up a two and a half to three pound fish. And they're strong enough to take a five, five ounce weight and a 25 pound fish with no mm-hmm. issues at all. And I think they're, they're just, uh, I just like the way they're balanced and for people with good experience, they're liking them and people with zero experience in my boat, they're getting the fish up. I haven't broke one yet. Everything's held up on them. So that's what I'm going to be sticking to in the future until I find something else. Now does uh and I'm sure everybody probably knows this but me, does uh, ugly stick the the catfish special, do they have a bank fishing edition, like a big one? Yeah, I think they go up to twelve feet. Oh, okay. And uh, what about the actions? Uh, are you fishing with medium, medium heavy? What are you fishing? Mine with? are considered medium heavies. Mm-hmm. Um and I think the catfish rod, like the the white one, I think that one's a medium heavy too, isn't it? That's a medium heavy, and it's on the lighter side. Mm-hmm. And the eight foot catfish special is virtually identical to it. Okay. Yeah, that I think that's the one I got in Kansas City last year, and I wasn't. I, I was disappointed, not because the rod didn't perform, but it was almost exactly like the ugly stick I got. And I was like, oh, I thought it was going to be different. Other, than, I mean, it did look cool with my orange abu but (laughs) yeah i mean looking cool is number one rule of fishing did you know that um yeah that's why i have black reels and orange rods and orange line and (laughs) you know the only thing not cool in that boat is me (laughs) there you go everybody brad Dirk, the legendary brad Dirk, just confirmed that looking cool is the number one rule so don't ever forget it (laughs) (laughs) Susquehanna Stan said some of these rods are seven foot six, but the real seat is two feet up on the rod, five feet, uh, five feet, six of the business in. So what I, I see what he's saying, like some of the handles are extremely long, but that's not the case on the ugly stick, right? Well, I can't speak for the longer ones because I've only handled them a limited amount. I think I think they're actually pretty long handled when you get into some of the longer ones. I got you. But I, I would have to stop and look again. Uh, Michael Johnson said, if Ugly Stick made their catfish rods in a heavy, that would sling an 8 or a 10 ounce is what we need. I've been fishing Ugly Stick since I was 16 and I'm 41. Do you know of any plans for them to make a heavier action? I don't, but I've been kind of saying that we need to beef one up. You know, if anybody listens to puny little me, um, <laughs> I do think we need a, a heavier one for a lot of people. But that said, I see just tournaments and traveling around up here. Now, granted, I'm in channel country. Mm-hmm. I think people way overkill their rods. You do? I, I do think people use heavier rods than they have to. Uh, I like a, a pretty light rod. Me too. I like the rod to take the abuse, not the, the drag on the reel. And, I mean, back in the day of, you know, when I was using rip and lips, I used a medium. No one else wanted to use a medium, but I used a medium all the time. And the seven foot ugly is basically a medium, even though it says MH on it. Gotcha. Um, yeah, the, uh, I think, so I have medium heavies right now. And other than the one spot I was telling you about where the current was crazy and I had to use 10 ounce sinkers just to keep the bait from flying up off the bottom. You know, I, I like that light action too, but I think they're, you know, if you're primarily fishing those heavier current areas, I can see a need for it. Um, just to get the, just to get the sinker out there. Um, 
And then uh, we we have a unique situation here on the Cooper River. We have a lot of grass, um, both on top of the water and floating through the water column. So you'll see your rod, like you'll throw it out, and your rod will just start bowing over like a flathead bite. But here, I like I, I'm like, that's no flathead. That's just grass loading up on it. And then you end up like wearing yourself out, reeling it in. So the heavier action rods would help with that too. But but I agree with you. In majority of the cases, I want a lighter action rod and I want a light reel. And I want to be able to feel that fish on that rod and actually enjoy him um, instead of just hauling them in. Right, exactly. And like I said, they're very forgiving for those who don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I deal with a lot of novices, so I like that forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, uh, Freddy's Outdoor Adventure said, ugly stick lower handle is 14 inches. Most big catfish rods are 12 to 13 inches lower. Gotcha. That's that's good research there. <laughs> I didn't uh, know. What's that? I didn't even know that. No, I didn't know that either. Uh, let's see. Big Dan said, boats make me ill, so I have to bank fish, so it's lots of full send. Yeah, and that's another thing, too. So you'd probably want to, if you were looking for an ugly stick, you'd probably want that 12 12 foot model so you can get that extra casting distance all right um so we talked about just about everything except for one question the world record channel cat is currently held by a guy well i mean was held by a guy in south carolina i think he is deceased now but um on the on lake moultrie and i believe it was 58 pounds um, I should have looked it up. It's either 56 or 58. That was 53, but it's in the 50s. It's 53. Okay. Do you ever see anybody breaking that record ever again? I still have a hard time believing it was a channel cat. So that's what a lot of people say. They they want an asterisk beside it. Um, but the thing is, is technically, according to record, there was no blue stocked in there at that time. Well, we'll never know. I mean, we'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, do you ever see, do you ever see a, a, a channel cat over 50 being caught anywhere? Probably not. Um, our record was broke here in North Dakota in 09 at 42. Mm -hmm. And it was a monster. I don't know what the length was. Um, I'm still a little saddened that it's not out of the Red River. It was actually out of a little small lake that was once stocked with channel cats and then 20 years later was moved to a trout lake. So mm. here you've got a tiny little lake with a 60 foot hole and they fed it trout twice a year. <laughs> and you know, the guy who his wife actually caught it, but he found out it was in there. He did his research and he targeted that fish. And that is really cool. That was not an accident. Oh, really? But you know, here we have this lovely river and I know there's been the previous record was 33 something. I know a couple 35s came out mm -hmm. after that 42 was caught. So they were never verified, but I know they were. And then, uh, you know, so that's big. I'm still waiting for my 30. You know, that's a, that's a big deal to me when I get that 30. I mean, I've had people fish with me and they'll get, you know, upper 20s and then they're telling people 30. It's like, no, 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 no. That's too pre too uh, precious of a it. number. <laughs> <laughs> so 25 and up is like monster, monster change. Oh, yeah. Um, my boat's usually good for a couple over 25 a year. This year I had one. It was 27, little just wow. a hair over 27. And uh, I had to look it up, but it's been five years since we boated a 27 in my boat. How hard does that thing fight? I don't know. I didn't fight it. I watched. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're licking your chops, huh? Oh, let me at him. <laughs> I knew it was big when it hit. Uh huh. And the really, really big ones like that, they'll get, they'll come in usually pretty easy until they get vertical, and then they just say no. And, and the gal that caught it, I remember she lifted up on it and the drag came down and she said, I'm stuck on something. And I go, no, no, I think the fish is just telling you no. So don't give it slack. <laughs> but don't, don't, uh, don't horse it. This is and it, it came up 
event, you know, it took a couple minutes. It came up. But the second I netted it, I knew it was an absolute monster. I hadn't even seen it yet. And I just go, oh, my God, this thing's huge. And mm -hmm. I threw it in the floor of the boat, and I was looking at it going, it's somewhere between 24 and 25, just looking at it. And it ended up, I think, 27 and 1. Wow. But those fish, you know it the second they hit the bottom of the net. You don't even have to see them, and you know they're huge. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Uh, Lee said, I'm surprised that Brad hasn't, hasn't gotten his 30 at Selkirk. Well, I wasn't going to mention that. I do have a couple up there. I'm talking about my stretch of the river. Oh, okay. So if if a world record channel cat was going to be caught, where would you go? Like if if somebody said Brad, I think it's got to be out of. I think it's going to come out of way. Two million dollars to go find a world record channel cat. Where would you go? I would have to find a lake somewhere. Okay. Because I think river fish just have to be too athletic and deal with current and deal with hunting and deal with environmental conditions that just aren't going to allow them to put that weight on. I never thought about it that way. Hmm. Never thought about it that way. And that makes perfect sense because they're always swimming against current unless they're in, you know, dead water or whatever. But Right. But... You know, at some point in their year, they got to migrate a river. They got to hunt in a river. They're always got to deal with current in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think it's going to have to come out of a lake. Any particular lake? That I can't say, but I think it's going to have to come out of a lake. Mm. Well, I'd like to see it that way. We can just. Uh... We can take that asterisk off of that that channel cat, that world record. <laughs> I do like that it's from South Carolina, but you know it's definitely not going to come from here. Not from Lake, not from where it started. Um, the Blues just dominate, and then the Flatheads after that. Um, you know, I've caught white cats bigger than channel cats in our lake before, and uh, they they get plump and juicy. So I, I don't know. I, the channel cats are fighting for their life around here i guess uh, oh yeah i mean the whole thing is a real estate battle and our fish don't have to fight that real estate battle yeah, yeah. that's a big piece of the puzzle right there mm -hmm. well brad man i really appreciate you coming on tonight and sharing your wisdom with us and and your opinions about some things and i know everybody in chat uh really enjoyed it so thank you so much hey thanks for having me awesome well i'm gonna pray us out we're gonna get out of here Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Don't forget, this Saturday, I'll be hosting the uh, the River Wars Tournament, the James River versus the Tennessee River, uh, Team Captain Stan and Jody. And that'll be this Saturday, 9 a.m. Eastern to 2 p.m. Eastern, right here on Palmetto Cats. We'll be live. Uh, might be some giveaways. Might be some other cool stuff going on, so you don't want to miss it. Make sure you set that reminder. Uh, thanks to Brad again. Let's uh, go to prayer here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to talk to Brad and share our love for fishing. I want to thank you for uh, blessing us with this opportunity to uh, talk. And I just ask that you keep everybody safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, happy fishing.